the perpetration of these inside jobs include eating only food which has been inspected and passed on, guarding against breathing radioactive dust, care in handling contaminated articles such as clothing, washing them or disposing of them if badly contaminated, thorough cleaning, especially the hair, and under the nails. Sound medical practice demands not only a knowledge of the way harmful agents operate, but an accurate estimate of those agents. Radioactivity is detected by various instruments, such as this Geiger counter, and pocket chamber. They have as their unit of measurement the Rentgen, or fractions thereof. This dial is graduated in Rentgen allowing for precise readings of contamination in persons and things. It will tell how much radiation the wearer has received. The human body's resistance to destructive agents and its recouping powers vary with individuals. This man might recover quickly from a rattlesnake bite. This one might succumb to a bee sting. Aware of this range of vulnerability, doctors have set extremely safe and low exposures such as three-tenths of a Rentgen per week as the maximum gamma radiation dose for laboratory and industrial workers with radioactive materials. They calculate that 300 to 500 times this much, 150 or more Rentgens, may bring out symptoms of sickness. The median lethal dose, which is the amount necessary to kill half the persons exposed, is placed by most medical authorities at around 450 Rentgens received by the victim's entire body and within a short period of time. Thus it takes a very special combination of circumstances to cause the death of a person by radiation. A combination that's a remote possibility in ordinary work with radioactive material and not nearly so frequent in atomic warfare as is commonly believed. But suppose that despite preparedness and preventive measures, one gets a dose sufficient to cause sickness. What then? Is this the stock answer? The unavoidable sequel? Or this? Most emphatically, it's this. Radiation illness lends itself to treatment. The treatment is symptomatic, which means that doctors relieve the symptoms or effects rather than remove the cause. To clarify, when you take aspirin to get rid of a headache, that's the symptomatic approach. Removal of an injured or an infected member of the body is specific treatment. A radiation patient is bolstered in all possible ways. The body, a remarkable self-repairing machine, if given half a chance, is assisted in overcoming the effects of ionization. For example, if the patient's supply of red blood cells is down, he is given a transfusion of whole blood. If the count of white blood cells, the policemen, the anti-germ guards of the human system, is so low he can't resist infection, he gets penicillin. Medical researchers are constantly seeking to supplement symptomatic with specific therapy. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki took the Japanese completely by surprise. Their medical facilities were pretty well knocked out. Nevertheless, an impressive share of radiation patients recovered. And it's estimated that good medical care might have reduced fatalities considerably. The Japanese didn't have that kind of care, yet the death attributed to the bomb's radioactivity made up a small part of the total, about 15%. It is reasonably assumed, though, that many who were killed by the bomb's other destructive forces sustained radiation doses that would ultimately have proved fatal. In short, they were burned and beaten into oblivion before they had a chance to die from radiation. Which puts the finger squarely upon one of the major fallacies in the public attitude toward atomic weapons. It's the fallacy of devoting 85% of one's worrying capacity to an agent that constitutes only about 15% of an atomic bomb's destroying potential. And that's unsound, doesn't fit. If you must worry, concentrate on the blast effect of an A-bomb. It's prompt and devastating. It causes a gigantic rearrangement of things, a complete change of scenery. 
and means sudden death to those who chance to be in the way when it happens. Don't forget the fires that follow. Consider the flash heat, which changes the complexion of all that it strikes. Bear in mind always that blast and heat are an A-bomb's most powerful weapon, that their lethal range is greater and their effects much quicker than the radiation. Blast and heat are hazards that warrant concern, but not panic, because they aren't new or novel. They are the same forces of World War II's conventional bombing, which some of you may have experienced. And you did all right. You're here. As food for thought, the possibility of atomic warfare and its relation to your well-being is understandably on your mental diet. But in your thinking, adopt the realistic viewpoint of a man engaged in a gun battle. His chief fear is not that he might come down with a case of lead poisoning, but that he's apt to get an extra hole in his head. Some of the falsehoods circulated about radiation effects are trivial, but upsetting. They're beamed right at one's self-esteem. And will eventually result in a race of bald-headed people. Just imagine it. Imagine yourself with no hair. They'll call you old skinhead, old chrome dome. And that's not all radioactivity will do. It will... Enough exposure to radiation will cause loss of hair. The treatment, if you'd insist, would be symptomatic, a toupee. But the condition would only be temporary. Your hair would come back, same color, same cowlick. A fear that is grossly built up in popular print is that radiation will cause impotence, which is the mechanical inability of a man to fulfill his sexual role. That fear won't stand examination. Another subject of misgivings is sterility. A sterile man can carry out his sexual obligations physically, but is unable to fertilize, to reproduce his kind. The estimated dose needed to bring about permanent sterility exceeds the lethal dose. So obviously, sterility by radiation would be just incidental, a matter a dead man wouldn't worry about. The public has been force-fed grave suspicion that extensive use of atomic energy, as in war, might eventually result in an overabundance of freaks, suitable for sideshow exhibition. We can start picking the freak possibilities apart by looking at a sperm cell, the kind of cell that plays a leading part in reproduction. These chromosomes contain the material through which such physical characteristics as color of hair and eyes are handed down from parent to offspring. Sometimes the chromosomes are broken up. This upsets the heredity controlling material when the cell divides, and the result may be a mutation, a variation from the parent. It occurs naturally and may also be brought about by radiation. But radiations can't produce any new kinds of mutation. They can only increase the natural rate. Is the increase enough to stew about? No. We can't experiment along these lines with humans, but we can observe the effect of radioactivity on mice and fruit flies, which produce new generations so frequently that to study them for a short time is like reviewing a long span of mankind's history. These are the probabilities, and they aren't important enough to lose any sleep over. Besides, a mutation can be a good variation an improvement over the parents. If you'll be honest with yourself, face the facts, you'll probably realize that your principal worry ought to be that your offspring will look just like you. <laughs>